morning, if we go ahead and open it up to Ephesians chapter 4, actually Ephesians chapter 6, and uh, I'll tell you what, if you open up to Ephesians 6, and then also if you want to place something marked there for chapter 1, we'll look there briefly here in just a moment. Uh, today I'm going to continue in, in where I, I left off last week, as we're going through we're talking about skills to a changed life. How do we have a changed life? And we set the groundwork by saying this, that change in our life happens at the point of salvation. That's the greatest change in any man's, any woman's life, is whenever they encounter Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. When they say yes to Him, change happens. Now, we all have different things that happen in our life, different changes. We all have where maybe it's marriage, maybe it's uh, kids are introduced, maybe it's a new job, maybe it's college, maybe it's high school, maybe it's junior high. We all have different things in life where we're experiencing change, but... That's a natural progression of life that everyone's going to go through. And reality is this, that affects our physical state. That affects our physical life. Now, some of you would say, well, that affects our mental state also. It does. But there's something supernatural that happens when someone believes in Jesus, puts their faith in Jesus Christ, and they call on his name and are saved when they're redeemed, when they're transformed from the inside out. There's a, something that's set in motion to all of a sudden there's, uh, there's a regeneration, what scripture talks about, where the Holy Spirit begins to refine and regenerate us from the point where we were born into sin, but now we're born of God. We're all of a sudden, we were of this world, but listen, at this point now, we're of his kingdom, amen? There's a place where there's a transformation, where we're from a carnal to spiritual, where we're walking from death, now we're walking in life eternal, amen? And out of that transformation, it starts on the inside. But here's the issue. We walk in a real intangible world. And the trouble that we have is what's taking place spiritually, what's taking place on the inside, it's oftentimes hard for us to wrap around our mind. It's hard for us to, to wrap around our emotions. It's hard for us to, our, our thoughts and our feelings about things. And what happens is we tend to lean or give to a point of least resistance. Where in oftentimes that's the flesh because we can control that. But here's the issue is that whenever we surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the desire, this is his plan, is that we now no longer be led by our, our feelings, no longer by our emotions, no longer by this flesh, but we be led by the Spirit. Amen? Out of the Spirit. And out of that, this is where we find life. Because the Spirit reveals Jesus, the Spirit shows us, and Jesus shows us the Father. And out of that, we begin to be more like him out of our relationship with him. In our culture, in our social mindset, we think we know so many people because just at the tap of a screen, all of a sudden we have within our fingertips reach thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not millions of people who we feel that we have a connection with them when in reality, we know nothing about them other than maybe their name and their URL, their address, and their best situations in life. But here's the reality. For us to get to know God and to know it, it demands that we lean in in the Spirit. And not just on our feelings, but that we begin to walk with the Spirit daily. And we begin to practice the gifts that as He ministers in our life. And that we walk in that faith and that place of trust in Him. This morning, I want us to step into the next level. Last week we talked about this. In Ephesians chapter 6, we see Paul is writing. The Holy Spirit is speaking through Paul. And he begins to address this issue. He begins to, to dive a little bit deeper. In fact, the whole book of Ephesians is really given to this truth. This issue of the difference between the carnal and the spirit. This truth of the spiritual warfare that's taking place in our lives. And here Paul just is summarizing once again what he has spoken. And look what he says in chapter 6 verse 10. He says, finally my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Last week we gave you this first truth. 
is this, is that if we're gonna have the first skill for us to live a life, a changed life, this transformed life, this is number one, is you gotta get in shape. And we emphasize the issue that this isn't a physical shape that it's talking about. However, this getting in shape will very much impact your physical, your mental, your, your, your emotional being. But it's this, is he says this, be strong. How? In your own abilities? No, in the Lord. And in the power of his might, not in your own strength, but look into his strength. Aren't you thankful for the Lord this morning? Aren't you thankful scripture says he's the friend that never leaves us or forsakes us. He's there with us till the end. In fact, he's there in the midst of our darkest hours, the same as he's there in the midst of our victories, amen? And now that place we can look to him and know that his face is shining upon us. Even in moments of sorrow, his spirit is with us. But in the midst of that, we have a hope because it's not by our might, it's not by our power, but it's by his spirit. And so the place of within our life, we're to get in shape spiritually. And this week, I want to pick up, I want to say this, we need to get real. We need to get real. Now this morning, I'm going to ask for grace. Because I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard, I'm battling right now internally because I, I've got some things that I want to address this morning. And I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant. But I, I want to say some things this morning. I'm going to pray that you grace me this morning. You would hear my heart. And that you'd hear the truth of the word in this. That your eyes will be open, not just to what you're seeing physically, but what the Lord wants to reveal to us spiritually. Let me say this. We're living in a time right now where people are so engaged emotionally, so engaged. I don't even say engaged. We, we are swayed so emotionally, so mentally in our thoughts, in, in, in our, in our responses, our impulsions, are that they, there's no sense in ways that we respond. It's simply out of our emotion or our feeling or our, our position in that moment. We see that even what's taking place right now in our nation. The turmoil that's taking place. There's not truth in, there's truth in there. But the problem is we're not being led by truth, we're being led by emotions and by, by attitude and by thoughts and feelings and physical things that we see instead of being led to a place of truth. Who is truth? Jesus. He says, I am the, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know what happens is the moment that we begin to look at man and we begin to set up an opinion based upon our feelings, our emotions, or what we assess physically, I want to tell you something. There's a great chance that you're going to move away from truth and begin to fall into a lie. I'm going to be real transparent this morning. I'm going to ask that you grace me. I want to tell you something. This year has been one of the hardest years of my life. People I've walked with, abandoned. People that, man, I spent life in encouraging. Offenses arise. And my heart, I, 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 I ask for, listen, if you're one this morning, man, if I've done something to bring an offense towards you out of my grief, out of a time in my life where it was dark, and if I did something where you felt I wasn't available for you, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to forgive me. But my prayer is this, is that you'd also grace me. That in the midst of my hurt, in the midst of my sorrow, in the midst of my pain, that I'm flesh and blood just like you. Now listen, this morning I, I haven't sinned, I haven't, but in times people make opinions or perspectives that cause ripple effects that are damning, that, that are damning, that cause heartache, that cause separation. In the midst when sin creeps in, this is the danger. Satan said, our scripture, Jesus said this, Satan, the evil one, comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I've come, Jesus has come, that you might have life and that more abundant. Friend, if I've offended you, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you, if I've said anything that's been out of Nathan, I ask you, I'm, I, that was foolish if I said something that was offensive or hurtful. 
Now, if I've declared the word of God and that offended you, that's between you and the Lord. But if I've hurt you, I ask you to forgive me. I ask that you would grace me. And I ask that we could walk together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And that we would decide to say, God, we want your will and we want all truth to prevail. And that not darkness and death and destruction. Amen? And here's the reality, because here's the problem, church. Out of the place, whenever we begin to allow, allow lies to creep in, when we begin to allow there to be a set, when we allow things to happen, and listen, most of the time out of the moment when we have questions is when we begin to give an ear to, to, to gossip. We allow to give an ear to things that are not so. Instead of coming to those who have the answers, who know, who will be very truthful and honest with you, we tend to look at the best case scenario and we make an, a decision, we make an assumption no matter the cost. That's a very dangerous thing to do. Very dangerous thing to do. Can I speak to you just as a, as a pastor? Now, I'm not trying to preach it, but just as a, a one who is a pastor. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. And, this, and I'm just taking a moment. I'm, I'm, I'm on soapbox, I guess, for a moment. But one who walks with you for, most of you know me since 2012. And out of that place, whenever all of a sudden whenever there's something that happens where there's questions that arise, and instead of coming and asking a simple question where truth could be prevailed, instead, make an assumption based upon either someone or something that you're only aware of for maybe a year or two, and allow it to bring dissension. Friend, I want to tell you something. One, that's not biblical. The Bible says if you have an offense, go to the one that you have an offense with. I don't know if you're offended unless you tell me, or unless somebody else tells me. But the responsibility is you to come to me and say, Pastor, I've got a problem. And I want to tell you something. If I've done wrong, I will be the first to repent. Man, I, I, I don't want anyone to walk in darkness. I don't want to walk anybody to walk in destruction. Definitely not at the cost of me. I, I'll, I, will, I will make the sacrifice, is what I'm saying. Amen? Why are you saying this, Pastor? Because this morning I want to deal with some very spiritual things. And here's the reality is for us to begin to deal with spiritual issues, then there's a place where we need to be transparent. The place where we recognize that if there's something where things aren't adding up to where we're all willing to say, God, we first and foremost become before you with a repentant heart. Lord, if there's any sin within my heart, we repent of that. I repent of that. Lord, if there's anything that I've done to bring offense, I repent of that. Amen? Because here's the reality. I believe that God's going to move right now in this hour greater than any day. This week, man, the Holy Spirit's been dealing with me about what it's things, pr prophetic words that he's saying. There's concerns I have with things that are, people are saying. But I'm going to say, Lord, what does your word say in this hour? And what are you saying according to your word? And I believe that right now we're on the brink of the greatest, one of the greatest sovereign moves of God than we've ever seen before. The atmosphere is charged for it, but here's the problem. If we allow the scenting of voices, voices that try to divide, if we allow hurts, even in our own lives, to push us away, you know what's going to happen? We will miss it. We'll be blinded by our physical state and our emotional state to the spiritual state. Paul says it here, and I want you to see this. Paul dives deep into this. The whole book of Ephesians is over this. But look what he says here. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Not just part of it, but all of it. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but you know what? In life, we struggle against it. We're not warring against it, but you know what? There's a place where we butt up against it. We have to deal with it. He says, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I want you to catch this. He said, we're warring against these things. And here's the truth. Life, reality is this. Life is bigger than what you see. The circumstances that are taking place are bigger than what you're seeing physically. What you're seeing physically and the things you're battling through, they're glimpses of what's taking place even in the heavenly realms and their spirits. But listen, the things that are taking place, it's way bigger than what you can see 
with your physical eyes. And there is more going on than you will ever know. It demands that we get real. It demands that we don't sweep things under the rug, but that we're honest and truthful. It demands that we're willing to go to one another in a moment whenever we're hurt so we can get healed. It demands that we walk as brothers and sisters in Christ. It demands that we're people of the spirit, not people of the flesh. It demands that we grow and mature in faith and in the spirit and not continue as babes. Look what he says. Man, this is a war. We're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Ephesians chapter one, I want you to look at this quickly. Paul goes through in this last part of the chapter, in this part of this letter that he's writing, the first part, he results in, he says, listen, this is my prayer for you, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. The hope of what? Of your calling? No, the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And, that what, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? He said, listen, this is more than just physical. This is a very spiritual, real thing. He says, listen, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the, his right hand in heavenly places far above all principalities and power and might, dominion, and every name that is named, not only is this in this age, but also in that which is to come. He says, listen, these principalities, these powers, these things of the air that's taking place, Jesus is seated above them. He's in full control, and here's the problem. The longer we remain in our flesh, in our emotional state, in our thoughts, we miss out in the spiritual. When we continue, we battle and wait. And listen, he redeemed us from this. This is sinful. It's going to do sinful things. And listen, and if we as a church remain in our carnal mind, we continue to try to appease the flesh we will continue to be disconnected from the power source and we ourselves will remain in sin. But listen, whom the Son says free is free indeed when we cling to the promise, the hope of what Christ Jesus has done for us and we begin to mature in faith and we grow in the Spirit and we connect to the life source. Friend, we're able to love through sin. We're able to love through our feelings. We're able to grace through heartaches, because why? We're walking in the spirit, not in the flesh. And the outcome is this, life abundant. Paul says, listen, if you're gonna continue living this life with just the things that you see, you're gonna miss it. When the revival, when God moves, you're gonna be the critic who's condemning instead of the one in the altar repenting. In the place of a heart, and my heart for us as a as your pastor, as a church, is that we would say, God, we want to move. Even when sin tries to raise its ugly head, we're going to address it. But we're going to walk in faith, looking to you as the Redeemer, who redeems all, who saves all, who calls on the name of the Lord. But friend, I want to tell you something. When sin rises up, it demands that something is done with it. If all we do is continue to stir it up, friend, the outcome is this we will become a sinful people. It demands that we address. If there's hurt in your heart, there's shame, if there's, if there's offense, friend, take personal accountability. Look at your life. If a brother has offended you, if somebody's done, listen, let's first look at the stake the, in our eye, the plank in our eye. <coughs> Say, Lord, forgive me that I can be a vessel of mercy that can be a vessel of healing, a vessel of the Spirit, and not one who comes to condemn and try to destroy, but one who can bring hope and remind people of your love. There's a reason why love, love covers a multitude of sin, but it's not our love, it's His love. Paul gives this truth is that even though the realm is invisible to our eyes, its existence and effects are as real as anything we can see. And here's the reality. Jesus addresses this and he gives us the agenda. He tells us what the agenda is. And I told you earlier, it's in John 10, 10. 
He said the thief comes to accept to steal, kill, and destroy. Listen, the enemy, his desire is to kill, to steal, and to destroy your marriage, your home, your relationship with your kids. Listen, those attacks happen in our home. I'm saying, I'm talking about mine and Casey's home. Those attacks happen in your home. Those attacks happen in your life. They're very real, but here's the reality. We have to have our eyes open, not just to the physical things, but say, God, reveal to us spiritually what's taking place. Have I become cold? Have my kids become cold? Have we allowed something in our home that doesn't belong? Have we allowed something in the church that doesn't belong? Then what must happen is we must remove it, must address it. Paul says you've got to have your spiritual eyes open. Be looking. Well, to dress. He tells us this is God's plan. He said, Jesus, he says, I've come that you might have life and that more abundant. Is your life growing? Are you experiencing life abundant? Are you walking in shame and defeat? Friend, that's not God's plan. He loves you too much for you to walk. He, God paid the ultimate price by giving his one and only son that you don't have to walk in that, but that you could walk delivered, whole, set free, redeemed. Amen? I want to encourage you. It starts at a place of repentance. It starts at a place of acknowledging, confessing, not only that we're wrong in our sin, but acknowledging his righteousness, that he's right, that he's God, that he's Lord. Paul gives a response in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and we see this response of so truthful of how in this. And he says this, basically, basically just says this, God doesn't want us to be ignorant of the devil's schemes. He doesn't want us to be ignorant of devil's, of his devices. Because listen, his plan does not change. He doesn't deviate. What he wants to do in your life is to kill you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to take all the blessing that God has bestowed upon you and he wants to rob it from you. He wants you to walk in depression. He wants you to walk with your head down instead of your eyes fixated upon the Lord. If he can take your joy, he can take your hope, he can take your faith. The place where in our life is when we learn to be of the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. So therefore we walk in the abundance of life evermore. Paul said, listen, don't be ignorant of his devices. Even whenever you try to fix things on your own, Paul says, listen, I extend apologies. I extend forgiveness in my flesh. But he said, listen, it's more than just that. There's some spiritual things you need to address. Some of you in your house, you need to begin to speak and prophesy in your home. You need to begin to prophesy in your places of work. You need to begin to pray in the Spirit. You need to begin to stir up faith in your home, in your life. And begin to recognize that it's more than just what we see, but there's a whole spiritual realm that's there. So in this, let me give you just a couple of quick hits. A couple of quick truths that I want to address this morning. We recognize that there's a devourer. Satan is at work. And his greatest desire, his greatest joy would see the United States fall. His greatest joy would see the church of the living God of the United States close their doors. His greatest joy would see that believers not come and get out of their homes because of fear of what they might catch. In fact, fear of, of a community, of community and connecting with others. Fear of, of disconnect. He would love to see we as people become reclusive and begin to hide. Because this is what happens when we disconnect from each other. Because here's the reality. You know what? Jonathan, you remind me of Jesus. Mike, you remind me of Jesus. Larry Hall, you remind me of Jesus. Billy, you remind me of Jesus. You catch what I'm saying here? When we get together and we see each other, we begin to testify of his work in our life. And it reminds me of the hope and it helps me continue to walk in the spirit, not just in the flesh. So the greatest thing that Satan can do right now is begin to shut things down. Begin to cause our focus and our, that which we have our minds on be deviated from Jesus and begin to be consumed with the things of this world. 
I love Brian made a statement this morning. He said, I'm not of this kingdom. I'm a part of a greater kingdom. The kingdom of God. Amen. And so our position should be in the same. Our attitude, our heartbeat should be that of the spirit of his kingdom, not of this world. This is what happens. I want to give you these quick hits. Number one is this. Is everything the devil? No. No. Friend, quit giving him that much. Don't give him that much credit. My leg ain't working. The devil made me do it. No. I've got pain. I've got headaches. The devil's giving me headaches. Quit giving him credit for stuff. Everything we want to do is blame it on the devil when in reality it may be us. Come on. God created you, formed you, and fashioned you. He put the right things in you for this body to function a certain way. If you deviate from that, guess what? There's going to be problems. Come on. You don't get enough sleep, guess what? You're going to have headaches, you're going to be malnutritioned. You're going to have problems. Rest is crucial to your body. That's what my dad used to say. One of the most holy things a man can do is take a nap. Come on, somebody. (laughs) I just gave you all all excuses this afternoon, all right? Right there. (laughs) Say I'm worshiping Jesus right now, and I'm singing the choir. (sighs) The choir singing right there. Can he make you, can the devil make you do what he wants? Everybody say no. He does not have that kind of power. He does not have the control, but you know what the problem is? We have a choice. We have a choice in the matter. And here's the reality, does he manipulate us? Yes. Will he do things and bring circumstances in your life for you to act on or to give you the opportunity? Absolutely. And you know what the problem is? When we're walking in the flesh, it's so much easier just to say yes. But friend, it's amazing. When you walk in the spirit, how easy it becomes to look to the flesh and say no. Come on, somebody. All of a sudden, that old girlfriend from high school starts trying to get hooked up with you on Facebook and want to have a conversation with you, and you have the audacity to start carrying on a conversation. Do you know where that road will lead? It's called divorce. It's called separation. You'll begin to entertain old feelings and emotions. Shame on you. Come on. Get thee behind me, devil. Did that opportunity arise? For, yeah, you know what? He might set up the opportunity, but you know what? You had a great choice to either hit delete, unfriend, no thank you, or to sit there and begin to dive in. Whenever it's all of a sudden quiet in the midnight hour and you start Googling through and you all of a sudden want to start looking at some and see, try to pull up some pictures, or you want to pull up conversation and see what happens, listen, the devil did not make you do that. Come on, somebody. But in that moment, that's where you need to be walking in the spirit to say no. When the opportunity arises, try to stir up that old demon of alcoholism, and all of a sudden opportunities arise, you say, well, if I go to this party, it's gonna be all right. I, I, I can say no. I can socially drive, I'm gonna get drunk. No! Shoot, why put yourself in that place? Well, I want to just, I want to minister to that buddy of mine who used to smoke weed with me all the time, and I'm just going to try to encourage him. What do you think is going to happen? I can go hang out with my buddies, and uh, this is a bachelor party, and you no, know, we're just going to go and hang out this place, and next thing you know, there's photos of you doing things that you might cost you your marriage and your future. All of a sudden, you pick up one of these novels, women. And you start reading things that begin to stir up emotions that your husband ain't taking care of in your, in your life. At least that's how you feel. And you begin to lust. And you begin, come on, somebody. No! In the place of it, it's a very real spiritual thing that's taking place. But it's affecting your physical body. The flesh, the lust of the youth is crying out, say, feed me, satisfy me. And the spirit is saying, He is more than enough. Jesus is more than enough. And reality is this, revival will not take place into your life until repentance begins. Listen, until we begin to humble ourselves before Almighty God, when we begin to repent of our sins, 
Well, he's forgiven me. Yes, he has. Yes, he continues. But the point of repentance is acknowledging I'm not gonna walk in the flesh. I'm not gonna walk in my soul, in my mind, my will, and my emotions. I'm gonna walk in the spirit of the living God. Therefore, I can overcome and I won't be deceived. Do y'all realize that this flesh is the very one they'll say, take that little pin and stick it in a light socket, see what happens. Come on now. You who are shaking your head, you probably did when you were younger and you're just testifying, don't do it. But the reality is this, the Spirit is crying out. Crying out, trying to lead you and guide you in all wisdom. But you have to make a decision. There's a place where you have to get real and recognize if I satisfy the flesh, I'm going to fail miserably where I'm at it spiritually. That flesh is going to call and beg for you to fall back into what Satan is calling for you to do. That's why Paul said, flee youthful lust. Man, I love when it talks about Jezebel. Throw her down. Let the horses jump over and the dogs eat her. Come on, somebody. Throw her down. That sin that keeps coming up, why aren't you able to get over it? Because you're staying in the flesh. You're more concerned about how you feel than what God has redeemed you from. But when we begin to have a picture of the cross and his redemptive work, when you begin to see how much God loves you and the horrific price that Christ Jesus paid that you can be redeemed and be able to walk in his spirit, Friend, I want to tell you something that will radically transform your life. But the problem is this. We continue in our day and age to preach a gospel without repentance. We preach a gospel that's just a feel-good thing that you say yes to Jesus and call him Lord, and then all of a sudden everything's going to be all right. No, listen, you still got to deal with this real life, this real emotions, these real feelings, these real thoughts. But listen, that's why he gives you his spirit to be able to engage those things. Because those things were leading you to death. Oh, but he came that you might have life. Come on. Is the devil, is everything the devil? No. Can he make you do what he wants? No. Does he try to manipulate, like, manipulate your life? Yes. Why doesn't God do something about it? He did. He did. I want you to look at this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. It says, in this way, he, God, disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Come on, somebody. I want to tell you something. God, Jesus made a spectacle of Satan upon the cross. Whenever God, man, looked and said, look how shameful he is, naked, stabbed, beaten, wounded, mocked upon a cross. The spirit world was shaking in utter concern of what might just happen. Colossians, it tells us that he was making a spectacle of the enemy, a spectacle of the spiritual rulers. He was making a spectacle. He was calling them out in the streets whenever he paid the price for all of our sins upon that old rugged cross. And friend, whenever he arose victoriously on the third day, it was done. Come on, somebody. He did. He paved way. But here's the issue. Pretending that these things don't exist, pretending that the spirit doesn't exist and that we're just all flesh and carnal. Listen, this exa- it's, it's not an option. Because here's what's gonna happen. If you continue to remain in a state where you ignore the spirit, you continue to ignore what the Holy Spirit is trying to say to us, how he's trying to lead us. This is what happens, three things. There becomes a recurring cycle in our life. Heartbreak, woes. All of a sudden you find yourself in sin and over and over again. You're like, I can't get out of this. I don't know what the problem is. It's because you haven't repented. Turn from your sins and look to God. Come on, somebody. Repent means to turn away from. But yet if you continue to dabble in it, guess what's going to happen? The same problems, hurts, woes that happened beforehand are going to happen again because it's a recurring cycle. The second is this, not just a recurring cycle, but all of a sudden it begins, you have entrenched thoughts. 
All of a sudden, the way that you think begins to be shaped by your physical stature. It begins to be shaped by your emotional state. It begins to be shaped by what you're feeling. When reality is this, when we're called to be led by the Spirit, we recognize that our feelings will lie to us. We recognize that our emotions and what we think will mess us up. Come on, somebody. But when we walk in the Spirit, we can walk in truth. The last reality is this, is that habitual habits begin to take place. Because we begin to try to take things in our own hands. All of a sudden, we begin to smoke and become a chain smoker. All of a sudden, we begin to drink. We begin to become an alcoholic. All of a sudden, we begin to turn to drugs. All of a sudden, and it may not be like weed and marrow. It may not be uh, uh, cocaine and heroin. It, 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 may not be, it, it, it may not be meth. It may be simply this. It may be just sleeping pills to help us try to go to sleep at night. It may be pills to help keep us awake during the day because we're not getting enough sleep at night and we're walking around like zombies. Did God plan for us to be like that? No. No, he called us to be people of the Spirit. Man, that when people see us, they see his kingdom, his glory, his goodness. And friend, listen, I'm not saying this to condemn you today. I'm saying this that hopefully you would find life. Man, that today you make a decision to say, I'm not going to walk in the flesh anymore. Man, I'm not going to continue to give and begin to continue to look at everything through a carnal perspective, through carnal eyes. I'm not going to continue just to feed my emotions and my thoughts and, the, and, 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 and my, 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 my way I feel internally and externally. No, I'm going to begin to ask the Lord. I'm going to be looking at his word and begin to live by his spirit. I'm going to begin to grow in that area. Because here's the reality. For us to deal with this, it demands that we aggressively challenge any adversarial assault in our life. Think about this. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. But what does he say? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but a what? Mighty in God for the pulling down strongholds. He says, listen, you don't have to remain defeated. You don't have to remain in this place where you're grasping for hope, where you're grasping for life, where you're trying to defend this here. He says, no. Begin to walk in the Spirit where you can find and experience eternal life, where you can experience eternal hope, where you can experience hope in the midst of your greatest battles. That in the place whenever sorrow tries to creep in, he sustains you by his spirit. When depression tries to creep in, he reminds you that he's giving you life everlasting. That whenever all those things, when Satan tries to rise up and tries to attack, you can fight victoriously. Does it mean there's not going to be battles? No, Jesus said there's going to be trials. There's going to be hardships. But friend, I want to tell you something. If you try to fight these battles just in the flesh and with your soul, your mind, your will, and emotions, you're going to lose. You've got to have your eyes wide open be get real and realize how much it demands that you begin to fight in the Spirit. A couple of these truths within this assault. Here's the reality. Natural responses aren't sufficient for spiritual issues. How we deal with things in the natural will not affect the spiritual. It will not make an impact in spiritual battles other than our loss. But here's the truth. God has given us exactly what we need to succeed. Amen? He's given us his Holy Spirit. Worship team, I want to ask you to come. I want you to understand this. Here's the reality in this assault, and as we aggressively attack, we're going to pray here this morning. We're going to do some, wage some war in the heavenlies this morning. And listen, you may not be used to a service like this. Maybe where you come from, your background may be a little bit different, but I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to help you out today, friend. I'll tell you something. The only reason why I'm even here today is because I know how to fight spiritually. The only reason... When I say here, I mean in Sherman, Texas. I'm not talking about just alive. I'm talking about physically here today. It's because I know how to fight spiritually. If 
I didn't, I would be selling cars or something. I would be working at McDonald's or something. Come on, somebody. That's not believing. I'm just saying I'd be doing something different. But here's the reality. I want you to catch this. Never allow yourself or your family to become a victim or victims of a subtle and stealthy stealthy adversary. When Satan tries to rise up, he's going to try to creep in. He's going to try to use those circumstances, try to destroy your life. If he can kill you, he can take you out of the fight, he wins. But Jesus said, I've come to give life. And that more abundant. 1 John chapter 4, 4 says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? I want to give you three quick truths of how you get real. In times like this, how do you all of a sudden get a reality check? What do you do? Number one, you need to stand. Believe in God. In this hour, in the circumstance of your life, you trust God. When my grandma, when my mama got all of a sudden got the news of cancer, I'll never forget, I've told y'all before, man, I walked in through her house and there were scriptures everywhere all over the walls. You couldn't go, you couldn't look in the mirror without seeing scriptures plastered all over. You go in the kitchen, look on the stove, there were scriptures. Go look at the sink, over the sink, there were scriptures everywhere. What was she doing? She was standing. She was believing in God. She was making sure that she fed her spirit over what was taking place in the flesh. Scripture tells us in 1 John 5, 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. What? Our faith. Our faith. So then how do we stir up our faith? We stand. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Scripture says, how do we build our faith? By hearing the word of God. Come on. Right now we should cling to the scriptures. Say, Lord, what are you saying this? So not only do we stand, but listen, we need to state. God will win. He has won. He's conquered death, hell, and the grave. He is the victor. Romans 8, 37 says, Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him, through God who loved us. (laughs) So our response is a place where we make the stands. Devil, you have no room in my life. Get thee behind me. And our position is, God, you have full control. Lord, greater are you who's in me, your spirit who abides in me, than anything in this world that has to offer or the way it has to throw at me. And the last simple truth is this. Not only do we stand, not only do we stay, but we be steadfast. Stand, stand fast. Don't give an inch to the devil. Listen, when he tries to creep in, he begins to lie to you. Don't listen to the lies. You know what happens? You'll lose sleep over that kind of stuff. Don't give an inch. James said it like this. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Man, that our response... Even in a time like this, whether if it's in a political environment, whether if it's in times when we're saying, go, what's gonna happen next? Whether if it's coronavirus, whether if it's issues where your home is falling apart, maybe it's your marriage, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your church, maybe it's, it's your job, maybe, I don't know what it is, maybe it's just life. Your position is say, God, I'm not gonna feed the flesh and satisfy the flesh because that's already tried to destroy me. Instead, God, I'm gonna remain full in your spirit. God, I'm gonna cling to you and I'm gonna stand steadfast. Resist to the devil. And I'm gonna look to you and I'm gonna proclaim that you are the victor, that you are my God. And I'm gonna keep my faith in you. Not in the things of this world, not in the circumstances that happen in life. But Father, I'm going to simply trust you.